Thanks for joining us today, guys. Today we are joined by Marty Strong and excited for him to share a little bit about his background. Uh, long, successful military career, followed by uh, a successful career in the business world and entrepreneurship. And so uh, really excited to hear your story, Marty. You mind introducing and kind of telling uh, audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me, Liam. Um, so I was uh, born and raised for the most part in Nebraska in the center of the country, but towards the end of my teen years, I started moving around Hawaii, Japan, uh, parents got divorced and, and then I ended up graduating from high school in uh, Gross Point, Michigan of all places. So I was, I think it was in a different high school all four years. And my, uh, my father was in, in the Navy and my uh, father had this idea that he, he wasn't gonna pay for college. So if you wanna go out and see the world, go, to the, go into the Navy, and then they'll pay your way through college after the fact. So I joined the Navy, uh, early entry program when I was 16, but went in about a week after I turned 17. And eventually within about half a year, I ended up at the SEAL, the SEAL selection program out in San Diego, actually Coronel Island, which is part of San Diego Harbor. And uh, six months later, I was one. So I did that for 20 years until I retired and went into managing money. And that kind of started my whole commercial life after, after the uniform. What, uh, did the SEALs thing just kind of happen or was that something that was on your mind in a direction that you were hopeful to go? It just sort of happened. It was, I won't go into the, the details because it's a long story. Although they put that story in the back of my uh, retirement brochure because the Admiral knew the story. So he wanted everybody to know that I hadn't, uh, sought out to be a seal i kind of stumbled into it it was an accident of orders and a uh a master chief talked me into staying and volunteering so that's what i did which <laughs> not too hard to not too hard to convince a 17 year old uh guy right at, right out of boot camp essentially when you're a master chief and you're a seal and so so i did it and um i don't know how the heck i got through it we had about 126 guys start and six months later, there was 13 of us originals left. I uh, had the distinction of being one of the best swimmers, but I was the absolute, the worst runner in my class on the first day and on graduation day. So at least the Navy's known for water-based activities more so than land, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad they were leaning that way in my case anyway. Yeah. Well, I guess the modern day SEALs is uh, not necessarily just all amphibious, but uh, that's that's fascinating, right? Uh, I'm sure there was some appeal to the ego from the master sergeant, uh, master chief and getting you uh, in and then, but amazing that you didn't no. plan or didn't train and just kind of persevered through. He did not appeal to my ego. Very little was known about SEALs when I was at that age and no movies or TV shows, et cetera. So what he appealed to was probably my stupidity and total ignorance of what SEALs were. He just asked some questions like, you know how to swim? Yeah, I, I swam competitively in the AAU um, all through uh, middle school, high school. Well, great. You know, are you, you've ever been to the ocean? Yeah, I lived in Hawaii. I was a surfer. Oh, well, great. So you won't be afraid of mother nature. And, and did you ever get, uh, were you in sports, team sports? Yeah, you know. What kind? Football? Oh, did the coaches ever yell at you and punish you when you didn't uh, perform? Oh, yeah. Well, this is just the way it is here. The instructors are like, like football coach. I mean, that's, that's about all I can remember from the experience, but it seemed very friendly. And it seemed like, uh, hey, well, why not? Why not try it? You know, I, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> uh, but you just got through it and made it stay, right? So something appealed to you uh, in the process. And yeah. Or I was... Uh, some, something in my head was clicking in a way that made me uh, resilient enough to you know, survive that whole gauntlet. Yeah, For sure. Not many can. Um, so as we fast forward, went into the financial services, became successful, right? It looks like you had a couple of companies yourself as well and ran a couple of them. Um, as you started to experience success and profitability, you didn't have to worry uh, about you know, roof over the head, food on the table, but what, what was your framework in terms of where you wanted to, you know, invest your time and money? So the way when I went into uh, financial services, you basically, you didn't get a salary. They, they gave you a, a training stipend for about four months while you're preparing for all the different exams that you had to take to get all your licenses. And if you, and if you fail, 
final exams. It was it was over. You were you were done. So I had a very short period where I was covered after I uh, retired from the Navy with 20 years in the, in the SEAL teams. And then basically they sat me down at a desk and said, good luck. So if I didn't get a, an account, if I didn't collect any assets, if I didn't manage money and grow money and everything, I wasn't going to get paid. I had little kids at the time. So I started from essentially a cold start startup. Not, you know, I had an undergraduate degree and a graduate degree in business management, but I didn't know how to sell because they don't teach that in college. And I found that I had to learn how to sell. I had to go out and find strangers that were willing to trust me and hand me their, their life savings or the proceeds from the business they just sold. So I struggled for first year or so, started to do well, got to a point where I crossed that threshold that you kind of described where I wasn't just trying to make enough money to, to make the bill payments and I was making enough money to relax a little bit. Then I got to a point at about two and a half years where I was making more money than I made in the Navy as, as an officer. And from that point forward, I started to wonder if I was going to do this forever and would I be good at it forever? Because if I just sat down and took a vacation, you know, my, my prospect funnel would start to die. You know, I, if I lost clients and didn't replace them constantly, my whole, you know, my whole revenue stream would die. So I couldn't, I couldn't sleep for very long. I couldn't walk away from the business because it was all about me and attention and persistence. So I started taking proceeds and investing in real estate. That was kind of my side gig as a, a way to take money I was making that was in excess of what I needed to pay the bills and to you know be just a little bit comfortable. And you know a lot of people that are consultants and salespeople that work off of commissions, et cetera, they live by real estate agents. They live by the same kind of motto. You, you put aside it enough until you've, you've met all your requirements for the year. And then what do you do with the rest of it? So in my case, I, I invested in real estate, rental real estate, and slowly built up a, a small portfolio of that. So that's how I did it in that particular profession of seven and a half years. And then I took, uh, after 9-11, I decided to get into, uh, get away from making other people rich and managing money. And I was trying to figure out a way I could help with the 9-11 uh, the uh, attacks, you know, go back into the government somehow, work in some capacity. So initially I was a consultant for about 24 months, did the Athens Olympics in 2004, did some other stuff that I can't talk about. And I started building up a consulting practice. So the consulting practice is, you know, again, you start off kind of slow. I've got one or two really good corporate uh, clients. They liked what I was doing. They liked my approach. It was all threat assessment, you know, stopping uh, Al Qaeda from attacking infrastructure in the United States and other places. And I was applying my, not my prior seven years of money management, I was applying my old SEAL threat analysis and target analysis skills. And I'm a pretty good writer. So I was able to write up all these different, these uh, different possibilities, kind of storyboarding them, which they really liked. And they just kept calling me up. You want to go here? You want to go there? So next thing you know, I pretty much reached the same amount of money in two years that I was making annually at the end of seven and a half years, having a lot more fun, wasn't working as much. It was kind of, you'd work a gig, collect for about 45 days, come back and write for 45 to 60 days. And then that was it. So I really liked that. I thought that was really, really interesting. I continued to put a little bit of money into real estate and increase that. And I think at that time, and I learned in managing people's money, I, I learned a lot about estate planning and establishing wills and all the other things that the instruments that anybody that's running a business or anybody owns a business should have in place. And a lot of times they don't, they're not educated in that area. I learned that kind of as I was growing my business, managing people's money by talking to the lawyers and everything that uh, focus their whole time on trusts and estates and wills and things like that. So I was able to make sure that I had that structured before I ended uh, my say third year in financial services. And by the time I did to finish the uh, two years of consulting, I had a pretty good I guess, base of revenue from the, from the uh, real estate side. Plus I was able to work kind of at whatever, you know, throttle forward, throttle back on the consulting side. And so that was kind of like my second endeavor in, um, in the commercial enterprise. After that, I, I got into the bigger, the bigger companies and building divisions and small companies. I'll pause there to let you. Did did the so you mentioned the strategy during the seven years as the financial advisor and rental real estate 
right? And then you you mentioned building up a nice base. Did you still invest in rental real estate, or did you kind of go a different direction with that? No, I, I stayed with that, and I think at at, at one point, I'm not talking about a tycoon, but I probably had about seven properties scattered around at the peak. And here's here's what's ironic: I didn't have enough time to manage my own portfolio and grow an investment account for myself in seven and a half years. So it's that old saw, you know, the, the Taylor's children have no clothes and that kind of thing. I, I was so focused on everybody else that I never really sat down and thought about taking a, a chunk of, uh, I guess what you would call it, discretionary capital that I might have that I didn't need for paying bills and build my own portfolio just for me. So, uh, so even at the end of the two years, I hadn't, I hadn't done that for myself in the markets, even though I was knowledgeable on how to do that. So once I got into uh, the government contracting world and the defense contracting world, what I ended up doing was building small subsidiary companies from one point of entry to a larger point of entry or exit. And in that case, it was, it was the first time in nine and a half years that I was making a W-2 paycheck. So I went nine and a half years after the Navy, 20 years getting a paycheck automatically, you know, it's just showing up in the account to nine and a half years of living off of commissions, fees, con you know, consulting work. And so suddenly I'm getting a paycheck to try to lead and manage these, these startups and these early stage companies that were a subsidiary. So at that point, I still had the real estate. I started to invest more in uh, the market. I started to get a small nest egg there and wasn't really into day trading, but I was into moving money around and, and kind of playing the trends. And that those two kind of combinations in the background were enough to kind of balance everything and my exposure to just working as a job. Because when you're building your own business and financial services, it is your business. And when you um, are a consultant, you're a you know, solo practitioner, so it's your business. Here, if somebody just walked in one day and said, you're fired, no matter what, what I did or how well I'd done, I was walking away and starting from scratch like any employee. So I, I, didn't, um, I didn't miss that point, having had nine and a half years being on my own without that kind of concern. And no matter how well I did at growing these, these different companies, and I was put in charge of lots of different little small acquisitions, go and check them out, fix them, figure them out, come up with a battle plan, that kind of thing, which was easy to do because I had the, uh, the analysis of companies based on my seven and a half years as a an investment advisor and portfolio manager i knew how to rip apart and put together companies figure out what their strengths and weaknesses were management teams etc the competitive advantages so you fast forward to uh where i am now i walked in and became an equity owner in a very very small company which is now much much bigger i'm in my 13th year as the ceo we've started multiple wow. companies we started multiple companies within there. We acquired a very small healthcare company, uh, had one employee. Now it's got 178 employees. And, and so these are just little incubation projects and a couple of, of cold start kind of greenfield companies. And then the one that we acquired, which was very, very small when we started. So, you know, that's kind of my journey as far as the types of things that I've been involved in and growing, aside from my own consulting practice now. So as you were coming out of the Navy, did you have a vision of where you wanted to go and what came next for you? Uh, you got into financial planning, right? Did, did you see where that went? Like, how did, how did you cast your vision to get to where you wanted to be? All right, this is going to be a terrible, a terrible answer because one of the jobs I did in the SEAL teams was I worked in a group called the Strategy and Tactics Group, looking out over the horizon for the Navy SEAL community. And I wasn't the only one, there was about four of us. And we were supposed to be the out of the box thinkers and the Admiral staff would toss us things that they wanted us to noodle on. So I was pretty good at it and I was pretty good at it all the way up. I was a good mission planner too. So when I was gonna get out of the Navy, I was gonna become a lawyer. So I took the LSAT, got all ready. And about three months before I was gonna get out, another SEAL officer, Found out I was going to try to become a lawyer and he took me to lunch and talked me out of it. So something I had prepared for, for about the last eight months I was in, went out the window and I just 
started going around to some of the major financial firms that were in Virginia Beach at the time. And I found Blake Mason Wood Walker, went up there. They gave me the annual report. I read it. I called the, uh, the uh, so I was, I was an operations officer at the time. So I called the operations officer of Lake Mason, not realizing what a COO is compared to, you know, a lowly operations officer in a SEAL team. And uh, he called me back when I was in the middle of a altercation with two other officers that were arguing with each other about something. And I was supposed to uh, adjudicate the argument. And I don't know what he said. I remember him saying who he was. And he said, you've got 30 seconds to convince me why we should interview you. I don't know what I said. At the end of it, it was real quiet. And then he said, okay, my, my secretary will call you and set up the interview. Click. And I'm like, what the hell? You know, so I had no idea what I was getting into, kind of like the SEAL story in the beginning. I, had, I, I didn't plan it. It wasn't some super strategy that I executed with perfection. And, and certainly when I ended up in the, in the industry doing it, you know, the first couple of days when I realized I had to go out and find my own clients. And yeah, I, I was like, what am I doing? What did I get myself into? So you fast forward, uh, the planning skills came into play early my my ability to uh, speak and, and brief helped me with uh, building the business using seminars and that's when some of the business education started to help more and more as it got bigger and I started reading everybody that was out there talking about how to scale companies etc and the planning started to kick in more and more and more so it was ironic that my seal capabilities and my my uh, education wasn't really applicable when I started for like the first 24 months it started to become more applicable when i got into something that was big enough and had enough scale and scope that all that fancy stuff started to apply again all the theory that you learned in the books <laughs> yeah it's you know it's great when you're thinking big thoughts for big organizations but when you're it's just you it's kind of feels weird but i still mm -hmm. believe you know you got to come up with your own thought process on your own personal exit whatever you're doing you got to think forward and say, okay, what do I want to be in two years? What do I want this business to be in two years? What do I think is going to happen in two years? And you have to envision both a successful outcome and you also have to envision a terrible outcome so that you can start thinking about how do you hedge against the terrible? If it's not going to be your sweat equity because you're all in, then how do you counterbalance that? If you've hawked everything you own, your house, your car, your kids, and all that put it in the business and there's nothing else left and it's 100% roll the dice, right? It's, it's either succeed or, or die. So if you start thinking about that future that way, those kind of the two track, great success and potential great failure, then you start thinking about what should I do to prepare for both? You should get smart about what you should do with a, with a successful outcome. Now, I happen to know how to manage money, but most people don't. I learned about getting the legal instruments in place to protect my family and all that. Um, most people don't. So there's a, there's a learning curve there on the way to success. And then there's also kind of a humble way of thinking through if I don't succeed, how do I hedge over the next five years, you know, put money away. Do, you know, do I have my, is my wife or spouse going to work and they're going to put that money away. Do we live within, you know, maybe a smaller means and save more money, you know, all those kinds of things, because, that, that's a possibility too out there on the horizon. So as you, at what point did you feel like you had a vision cast where you, you know, you were, you had the optimal and you had the, you know, worst case. At what point did that start clicking and uh, kind of coming into play for you? Was that when you were in the financial advisor role or did that come after? It's happened a couple of times because in each, in each kind of phase, you get, you know, you go through the, make it or break it. Then you get to the, the tipping point where you're making it. Then you get beyond the tipping point where you're doing well, you're not just making it. And then I started a new profession. And so I had to start that whole cycle again. And I think when, when I joined the company that I'm still the CEO of today, and there's more than one company now, the, um, it, was, it was exciting for me because I went from a billion dollar organization with lots of little companies to this one small company. And I could sit there with my partner, the guy that was the founder and say, what's the art of the possible? What, is, what, what can we do with this? And 
we were able to draw up some ideas and I put it in a one page strategy and I could see that future. I could, I really believe we could achieve it. And we did in the next three to four years, he ended up exiting when we sold to the employees. So now it's an employee owned organization with multiple companies, not just the original company. And so each, each time we hit a different phase, like when we sold to the employees, I was asked by the private equity people to stay on for three years to help lead the new entity. And I immediately realized we needed to hedge against what the core company did for a living because that market was shrinking and we needed to find something else with better margins. So I wrote up a strategy and we ended up buying a healthcare company 12 months later. So that was fun too, because now we've got this healthcare company with one employee. What can it look like? What can it be? You know, where could it grow? You know, it's, it's the, the opportunities and the possibilities were endless, just as the, the opportunity to fail miserably <laughs> were also endless. And so that kind of reinvigorated me and it made me think all the way through all the basic planning points again, taking a vision and converting it into a working concept and that concept into a strategy and then that strategy into a battle plan to achieve the strategy. So, and we've done, actually we've done, that that particular acquisition was a heck of a lot a heck of a lot bigger and faster moving than i ever expected it to be so yeah it accelerated beyond the pace was much much faster than i thought the growth was going to be i thought it was going to be much more incremental and it wasn't it was more parabolic so during all these changes i'm sure there was a lot of chaos and unknowns that you were trying to navigate you know, how did you go about that? And, you know, did that skill set come from SEALs? Did you develop it along the way? Kind of um, talk to me a little bit about that side. Sure. So, you know, you can get your poise through scar tissue, which I think is probably the, the traditional way to do it. Education doesn't give you poise. Exposure and experience can give you poise, but education just tells you, kind of the framework without filling it in with bricks or, or, or mortar. You have to go in there and you have to get scared. You have to bang around. You have to basically get cut, get banged up, fall down, stand up and watch other people doing it. And then you start to slowly gain the resilience, the psychological resilience that you have to have when you decide to either lead something, buy something and run it, found something from scratch. These are, these are all areas of, of leadership that require a stamina that is more driven from your psychology and determination than it is from your physical stamina, you know, from the, from the classic sense. So you, um, you, I obviously derived a lot of mine from the seals. I mean, I was a pretty tough teenager from a lot of different things in divorce family and all that psychologically. And after 20 years in the SEAL teams, I was, you know, physically had great stamina and, and psychologically they train you to get even stronger than you were when you walked in the door. They, they test you all the time. They, they, they make you fail on a regular basis as part of the training process so that you learn that failure is just part of the deal. It's just part of what happens. So you lose your fear of failure early on and you build failure into your battle plan going forward. You know, it's going to happen. So I had that advantage going into the commercial marketplace. I had that already in my mind. But, you know, when you run into something you haven't run into before, like the fact I didn't know how to sell, I was like anybody else. I was sitting there going, how am I going to do this? I had all the, the uh, self-doubt that anybody else would have running into, a, into something they hadn't experienced before. So then I had to go out there like anybody that's ever sold before. And I was, I was pounding plastic for, for dollars and I was cold walking and knocking on doors and I was standing in convention centers and malls and booths and stuff, you know, watching people steal all my free stuff. And um, I mean, I had to learn from scratch what it was like to engage the public and try to get them to buy something from you. And in my case, it was to buy me as their advisor. Yeah, that was a painful learning curve, but you eventually get the scar tissue. You eventually get, you know, you, you get the wisdom that's gained from all that, that all that failing and falling down and getting up. What would the biggest piece of advice be that you have for someone who's starting in a sales role without previous experience? Go find everybody that you know that sells anything. It doesn't matter what it is and ask them how to be a good salesperson. Listen to all of the advice. Some of it will be consistent. 
now, maybe not all of it will be applicable. I got mine from somebody who was selling machines that put clear wrapping paper or wrapping film around meat. Okay. That had nothing to do with what I was doing, but the way you approach people, the way you communicate the, uh, the relationship driven kind of sales process. I got a lot of that from that one person. So ask everybody, uh, read everything you can on sales. And while you're doing all that at night or on your weekends, Monday through Friday, you know, for 40 hours a week, go out there and talk to people. Somebody told me a vice president, the first financial services firm walked up to me one time and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm cold calling, I'm cold walking all that. And he goes, okay, I'm gonna give you one piece of advice. Go find out where the money is and go shake hands with it. And then he walked out of my office and I really didn't understand what he meant at the time. But the thing is we were trying to get people to invest money. People with money have money to invest. So me talking to, you know, regular people on the street wasn't going to, wasn't going to float my boat. So eventually I had to figure that out. And that's the same in all sales. You have to find out who is it you have to shake hands with, go out and shake hands with them. As we're wrapping up, Marty, what's the most exciting thing that you're working on today? I think the most exciting thing is probably my involvement in Best Robotics. Uh, Best Robotics is a nonprofit technology organization has been around for 30 years. I'm on their board. They, um, they do these competitions, two-day competitions all across the United States, sixth grade to 12th grade. And what they are is they're basically creativity incubators. They're accelerated creativity experiences. The, um, everything's paid for for the kids. So from an economic standpoint, there's no social economic barrier for this organization. And there are lots of sponsorship from big technology firms and I was, I was asked to come in pro bono to work on strategy development. What are they going to do for the next 30 years, et cetera. But now I'm involved in, in a group that's, uh, they call it the industrial development committee. And what we do is we're trying to think out of the box. We're trying to think of new things we can do with the technology um, exercise, the, the experience of that, of that competition. Can we take it to a different level? Can we take it to different populations and, and I'm not a technology guy, just like I'm not a healthcare guy. Uh, and I wasn't a financial guy. So, you know, it, it, it's exciting because it's not as scary as trying to learn from how to sell from scratch. And I'm, I'm talking to people I would normally not talk to. I'm talking to all these, these people that are engineers and technology experts and guys with, you know, McKenzie and, and Stockholm, Sweden, and all kinds of, of interesting characters that are coming in from different angles of attack and different psychology as far as how do you incite people to be hyper creative and innovative, especially if they get older and they've already started to get hardening of the arteries as far as they follow the rules, they only draw within the lines, that kind of thing, which there's not really, not really an age related requirement to be creative, but we kind of self-impose that or organizations and structures say, stop thinking so big, stop thinking so wide, walk this line. And, and that inhibits everybody so that's what that's what i like you know that's new right now that's very cool that's awesome and a way to give back and help others and stretch them so very cool um for the listeners who want to learn more and be able to connect with you marty what's the best way for them to get in touch so i have an author's website it's marty strong nimble.com all of my novels my two business books are there articles and uh that's the best place marty strong nimble.com Awesome. Well, appreciate the time and the insights today, Marty. Uh, it was a wonderful chat and I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Liam.